Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Show. We're excited for another show, and it's great to have you all join us. Uh, tonight we have a special guest, Holly and, uh, and <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> and Mark Jensen, and they are going to walk us through some information. Uh, the topic is light in the grand landscape, and light's kind of the most important thing when we're, we're talking about photography, so we're looking forward to uh, hearing from them. Um, my name's Kevin Rowe. I live in South Jordan, Utah, and uh, I'm a moderator and a curator with both the Landscape Photography Community and Landscape Photography Theme. And uh, my favorite thing is to get my uh, hiking gear and hike up into the mountains and take pictures of the landscape. So, uh, Tom, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. I'm Tom Hurl, and I'm in the central coast of California. And like Kevin, I enjoy hiking up in the mountains, getting to the Sierras, as well as our local uh, Ventana Mountains here. Um, and I'm also a curator in the landscape photography theme as, um, as well. Great. Thanks, Tom. And Margaret? Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Tompkins from Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I'm an amateur uh, photographer. I'm retired, so I really like to get out in the landscape and uh, uh, take pretty pictures of what I see out there. So it's a pleasure uh, to be here this evening. And uh, along with the others here, I'm a moderator in the landscape photography community and also in the landscape photography theme. So two of our favorites on Google+. Plus. Great. Thanks, Margaret. And Jim, a little under the weather, but he's here. Yeah, just a little. Thanks, Kevin. I'm an amateur enthusiast photographer based in Phoenix, Arizona. So love to get out and shoot southwestern landscapes. And fortunately, I don't have a lot of mountains to hike nearby, although I love mountains. It's just not the hiking uphill bit. <laughs> um, also participate in the landscape photography theme and community. All right, great. Thanks, Jim. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we're going to start off with uh, our portion of the show where um, everyone has submitted their photos to the show, and we go through and we pick our favorites, and uh, we'll go into those. So here is mine, and uh, this is Madison Tree Studios, um, Jerry Kittle. And I just really liked this one, um, perfect light on the landscape. And it's a simple landscape, yet beautiful. And it's, it's because of, the obviously, the storm clouds, but yet there's some wonderful light on the mountains as well. Uh, Jim. Yeah, my choice uh, tonight is Mike Henke. And, and I love everything about this photo, but you know, since the theme is seeking the light, I, I thought this was really... Uh, representative gorgeous early morning light I like the texture in the clouds and and the way the the backlight lights up the mist with a bit of color and the backlight on the trees just an amazing capture well done great and Margaret uh, this is one from Donna Fullerton and she shared uh, several just amazing photographs uh, to our event definitely go check them out this is one of Antelope Canyon and I just love how she captured the light there and all the wonderful patterns. I never get tired of Antelope Canyon, and but this is just superb. I just love everything about it, the lines, the color, the patterns. It's just gorgeous. Great. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, and I believe this is Holly. Oh, yes. Yay. I'm glad you put it up for me. Thank you. Um, I loved this, sh this shot. This is from Jesse Martineau. It's called, it said Northy Golf, golf Stars. It's a beautiful northern lights on, the, on a golf course. I thought this was great. I love the light and the, the stars and the green grass. It's just a beautiful shot. Well, pretty unique doing that on a golf course. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mark. Yeah, this is the one from uh, Chris uh, Newham, uh, Moment of Light on Winaka. Um, I just like the singularity and the isolation. Um, the, the grayish tones, um, not pushing to black and white, but still giving the quality of a black and white with almost light. And so I found this really compelling. I really enjoyed this one. Great. All right, great. Thank you. So we had a lot of, a lot of great photos in there. As usual, it's really hard to pick them. 
uh, pick just the ones that we can put. So uh, keep uh, on future events. We appreciate everyone showing, the, sharing those photography or their photography with us, and uh, we hope to see more. So I'm going to go over to Margaret, and Margaret, I'll let you introduce uh, Mark and Holly. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we're just really pleased tonight to have Holly and Mark Jansen with us. Uh, they are professional landscape photographers and workshop um, leaders. Uh, they've been doing this for like 20 years, so they're really experts in it. And uh, uh, I love how they, they put together some of these uh, great destination workshops to wonderful places like Big Sur and the Eastern Sierras, um, Yosemite and the Oregon coast, and even Africa. And uh, some are short, some are long, so they have something to offer for about everybody. Uh, but uh, they do amazing uh, photography work themselves, and they have that wonderful ability to teach others how to do it. So um, without further ado, uh, here's Mark and Holly uh, Jansen, and they're going to give us a presentation on Seeking the Light in the Grand Landscape. Well, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're excited to uh, to be showing you this tonight, and I will uh, I will start my screen share so you can see our presentation. Okay, this is good. So our introductory screen. Um, we do fine art, landscape, nature, and wilderness photography workshop expeditions. Uh, like Margaret said, we do private and small group photo tours to California, American West, Iceland, Africa, and Europe and beyond. And beyond. <laughs> so tonight our, our presentations on landscape photography, seeking the light in the grand landscape. And like we mentioned earlier, the, the light is a key element with landscape photography. And you can have all the filters in the world and everything, but you're really going to have to get up ultra early and hike in or drive in or get there at the moment. The golden light, we all, we all know the golden light, that 10 minutes before and that 10 minutes after. So Unless you're in Iceland. Unless you're in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> Where you have about five hours of that golden five light. Five hours of golden light. <laughs> So the first type of light, so we're going to go through different types of light that uh, that are affected during a landscape photography. So you think, yeah, it's just morning and evening light, but we're going to talk about all sorts of different types of light that are going to be, that you work with in landscape photography. So the first one is reflected light, so it would be bounced or diffused. This light's really important if you're, well, of course, if you're in the southwest, there's some deep canyons out there that are really helpful for this. Um, you know, mid-morning, 11, 10 o'clock, or 10.30 in the morning, you're going to get some light seeping into these canyons if you're deep down in them. This is a shot we did in the, the Narrows. Um, or this can be applied in anywhere, any kind of canyon or tight area, where light will bounce and reflect up different uh, walls and um, it's diffuse and bounces in. What I love about the Narrows is this... Um this this the scale of things and if you look you, I don't know if you can see very closely but these are hikers down here and they're m miniature compared to the size of the walls so it's a fun place to photograph and it gives you a good quality of light these canyons um, some are lucky to be close to these canyons and um, many times venture into them and you just have such great opportunities with the reflective light and it's just very rich and very golden it's sort of like the, the, the 10 minutes before sunset or after, uh, what's before well, sunrise and sunset, and then it's midday, so you get that nice warm glow. So, uh, so Mark, how'd you set up for this shot? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a shot I set up. I actually hiked in, oh, probably about uh, three miles or so, oh, three miles, I would say, and set up in the midstream. Um, it was in April, and um, I had to get out in the water and to get this one. Um, it's an amazing place, the Narrows. They have a lot of reflective, um, you know, uh, what do you have, the polished, the polished uh, sides of the walls of these canyons is quite rich, and um, I enjoyed this one quite a bit when I got this one. Came really close to losing a camera in this one. <laughs> I think I was about three, well, about, oh, ten inches off the water for this one, but I had to get that, that rock in the foreground, you know, and uh, that's how I set this one up. I would highly recommend this hike. This is oh, yeah. amazing. It's just great. So the next type of light we're going to talk about is overcast light. Cloudy days, light is soft and bluish, acts like a diffuser. 
Uh, so uh, this is a Central Coast shot. Of course, we get the fog rolling in and the Central Coast, and uh, get all the the light just creates a large shadow or a light box, and provides a great. Um, a nice soft light. Soft light. Overall soft light. This is another one we shot on the Big Sur coast. Uh, of course, it's uh, overcast, and some people get really upset when they don't have blue skies or, or, or you know, working the concept or working the cons the, uh, the composition with blue skies. But what you get with uh, overcast, you get real definition in your compositions. You can see deep into the shadows. And it really sets off the whole the whole show for you, and you know never let overcast skies throw you because you just can really works great with the contrasts. And and the saturation of the colors comes out easily too. We were just up in Big Sur as we mentioned, uh, doing a workshop over the weekend, and there were fields of yellow flowers um, in the Garapada area and. With the gray skies, the yellow flowers just popped out. It was just beautiful. And you're not fighting so much with the you're not fighting so much with the high contrast of the sunlight, and normally when you get out there, unless you get out there bright and early, you're going to have to be dealing with a lot of high contrast with florals. And um, when you have this kind of light, you can really punch out a lot of the detail very simply, and it's easy. It's not too complicated. The next, uh, oh, here's another, another example of it, but we did this early morning light, which is a diffuse light. Yeah, this is an early, uh, about 10 o'clock as the sun was rising over the coastline. And, of course, the fog is really prevalent on the Big Sur coast, and it works to your advantage in, for compositions. You get that nice definition of line, um, and it's just wonderful for uh, capturing these type of coastal views. And you can see how the grasses are sparkling in this picture because the, the light comes up over the mountains and shoots down on this. This is around 8.30 in the morning where we're getting this. And then, of course... Later in the day, in the evening, you're going to get a similar exposure. Uh, you wait till the. Okay. okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Cue. <laughs> no, this is and this is actually in the late, late evening. Just uh, you know, at a time where you're you're tempted to pack it up and go like, oh well, you know, the last light has come, the sun has set. That is the time you need to be out there. So uh, many photographers make the mistake of packing up their gear and running back to their vehicles, or you know, uh, right when the the magic is going to give you a second show. So I always recommend waiting till the, the extreme dark before you leave because um, you might miss something. And I, I think that's so much with uh, landscape photography, people don't realize that you know, the most important tool you have in your camera bag is not that, that, that $2,000 lens, it's that patience. And if you learn enough patience, you're going to get some great shots regardless of what you're packing in your camera bag. Just, just sit, wait, breathe, relax, and things kind of magically happen, and just prepare for them. And, and I guess what we're trying to say is it's about the composition and it's about the light. Mm -hmm. And those are the most important things. This was a fun shot. We shot this down in Malibu. Uh, we had some nice, uh, this is morning, and we had some amazing clouds happening. And it was, the sun was rising behind this cloud, monsoonal cloud, and I had, we had some birds fly by. So it just made it a really dramatic composition. Now, are those like storm clouds there? Um, it was. It was sort of like I shot this in probably late August in um, in California. We get these monsoons that come up from the south out of Mexico, and you get these these type of storms, these really uh, almost dramatic storms um, that come in during the uh, during this time of year. Um, they come I, up from Mexico. They come up from Mexico, and uh, I do actually. I do some of my commercial photography. I, I on the side, I you know, I do a lot of uh, some aviation photography, static stuff on runways. And each season, I wait for the monsoons to come in so I can so I can uh, put these in the backdrop of my plane photography. And um, and I, I remember shooting this one. It was during August, and and for this, this is disturbing. The clouds are a little more disturbing and not as uh, consistent, but quite nice. So one other example of the diffuse light would be uh, rainy conditions, and of course uh, Yosemite any time of year is magnificent. Yeah, so. this this particular time I guess we were a small group on this 
particular event workshop, and it was everyone was really upset because their cameras were getting wet, and and I kept pushing people to get out in the rain, and pack those umbrellas because that's when you're going to find the drama in, in Yosemite, um, and it was a very high, it was a high rain year, and so we were getting some some nice uh, dogwoods here. Of course, that's uh, you know that's El Cap there, and it just it just gives a definition to the shadows. I'm a real fan of the black and white. Here's another one on that same event. We had some great, great clouds and just uh, just wisping in and out of the valley. And so it's our favorite time to to go to Yosemite. Actually, love the drama in that. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was compelling. And this is an interesting angle. This is not really. Uh, people don't really shoot on this side of the valley too often. You know, this is kind of coming in the backside. So. I love those clouds on there. Yeah. All kind of rolling in. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. This was another one where uh, I had set up. I was working on this whole concept of dropping the sky out, and um, I was all set up, and I was really intrigued that I was getting. Uh, there were clouds, and almost the waterfalls were almost, I call this like cloud bursts. So basically, cloud burst falls. It is Yosemite Falls, but basically, that's not water. That's sort of a stream of clouds being, um, um, uh, you know, just basically uh, siphoned out of, out of the sky into the valley. <laughs> and as I was setting up for the shot, the rain just came, and I just got some quick drops. So I just, it was really a fun moment. And of course, another one. And you know, when I usually take a shot like this, I'm you know I'm, I try to think in black and white when it's cloudy, and that's a lot. Of what you have to do, you have to switch your brain over to this other mode. Um, and people say, oh, it's not blue and sunny, you know, and not colorful. Think black and white, and then you're going to get your contrasts, and it's a lot of fun. This isn't a, spr a spring storm with the uh, cherry blossoms in Yosemite Valley. Um, so the uh, the next uh, the next type of light we're going to talk about is backlight, and uh, a lot of people are you know can be afraid to shoot into the sun, but look at the drama that you can create uh, shooting into uh, shooting into the sun. Um, this was a fun time. Again, if you're you know we we were coming back from a workshop and we were cruising down the east side of the Sierras, you know, 70 miles an hour, going we got to get home, and then we saw this <laughs> we saw yeah. this scene. And you know, you get something like this, you know, very, very rarely. So we had to stop and, and yeah, get just, this shot. Yeah, we just, you know, pointed. And the, I guess what made the shot when you see those God rays, they get. I mean, we all get excited when we see those rays of light, and you're just hoping something's going to work in the image for you. And this one worked for us because I was able to light up the, the little farmhouse in the bright foreground. Just here. It was right there. I don't know if you can see it there, but. And that was a really quick shot. It was, uh, but it was just embracing the light and just working with the light, and making that, um, you know, just hoping for the moment. And so much of landscape photography is preparation and being ready and know your settings where it becomes second nature, and reacting to it. And and um, I think that's you know when you're sitting there when you when you're fiddling too much with your settings and your aperture, all of this, you're missing the moment. And 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 it's really. The key is to get beyond, beyond the camera, and I don't know if I'm repeating a lot of this. People have heard this before. Once you're comfortable with your gear, um, you can you can just be more creative and, and step beyond it. And, and that's a, I think that's a real that's a real important thing for landscape photographers to realize. It's 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 less about the gear, more about the moment, and um, if you and you can capture some great moments if you're just prepared for it. Let, let me interrupt you real quick before we get too far away from it. Uh, got a couple of viewer questions. On the uh, David wants to know on that shot you had in the Narrows where you uh, were in the water, were you weighting your tripod down with anything? Um, it just I let me think. I think I basically was keeping. I, I, it was one of those moments where I had my left arm on it and I was pushing it into the ground. And uh, pushing it into the water to keep it from sticking moving. it into the rock. Oh, sticking it in the rock. Yeah, we're just jamming it in there. Was, yeah, I was doing it too. And we're just trying to d deal with that, and hopefully not to get so much vibration on it. And um, and I think I was pretty close. This was a couple of years ago, but I was pretty close to the surface. So it's just a matter of leaning into it. And I was so close to the water, I had no way to really put a counterweight at the bottom of the, the tripod uh, to pull it down. It's just a matter, of, you know, it's one of those shots where you're 
you just have to react to it, and um, and basically I leaned down on it. I didn't use a, uh, I didn't use any kind of counterweight. Okay, great. And then uh, Mark wants to know, how do you decide when to make your shots black and white? Oh, good question. That's a really good question. Well, a lot of times, um, I I tend to shoot for textures mostly. I'm a very texture oriented photographer. Um, I'm I'm attracted to um, um, the the granite, the rocks. When you have a lot of textures, um, it's the time you reach for the uh, black and white. Uh, like this one. Like this yeah. one particularly. You know, in Eastern Sierras, um, we go up there quite a bit, um, and it really leans towards it. And this is why Ansel was so uh, uh, moved in this direction so much because of. So much of the Sierras is all about textures and contrasts, and um, that's the reason. That's that's why I reach for uh, black and white. Yes. Great. All right. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mark, would you say most of the shots you do process in black and white? You you visualize ahead of time that it's going to be black and white. I, I wish yes. I could say that, but a lot of times I'll take the shot and I really don't like the way it looks in color. Then I try black and white. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yes. This, yeah. Well, this is a, this one right here. Uh, particularly, I shot this in color, and and then I went with black and white. I shot this location quite a few times. Um, it just leans itself towards it. You know, when you just find those, just be conscious of what the textures around you, and the ruddier the textures are, and the more con you know, that's when you reach for the black and white, and then you start I start thinking differently about what I'm shooting. So, uh, so, and this one, you actually you have it in both black and white. Yeah, colors, I do have this. I actually, there's, there's a couple in here that show this location shot in two different ways. And then we, uh, the starburst technique here. Um, do you want yeah. to talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, this, oh, this sunburst technique. And this was shot at uh, F18, of course. And the way I set up for this one, um, I used a couple of different techniques on this. I, I kind of, uh, you know, of course I'm at F18, or to F18. And then I move, try to move the, I try to move the, uh, the in the exposure just to the edge. So if you move it close to the edge, without the sun blatantly blasting through, but if I can just push it off or cut like maybe a quarter of the blast, you're going to get more of that starburst effect um, here. So, Mark, was this a single exposure? This one here too. This is actually uh, this was th uh, three exposures actually. Okay. Or was this two exposures? That's no, just three. Mm -hmm. Here's another starburst, uh, bad water. This is out in Death Valley. It's the same effect. I think it's F22 on this one. Very wide. So another example of uh, backlight morning sunrise at Bosque del Apache. Um, and this was not. This color was not pushed at all. This was the way it looked, and so um, you get a lot of the, the fire sky. They call it in a Bosque. If anyone's have been out there, you know, in the winter, if you're if you're brave enough to go out there, and it used to be you'd have to brave the cold. Now you have to brave the other photographers. The cold <laughs> was easy to handle, but <laughs> so uh, but you get a lot of uh, you get these amazing skies down there, and we try to go out there a couple of, every other year, or so we'll run out there. Shoot it. Beautiful color. Another Central Coast California shot. So evening sunset backlit. We uh, we had a pretty amazing sunset in Morro Bay the other night. This the beginning of our Big Sur workshop, and we did the sunset just on the other side of Morro Rock, as you can see in this picture. And after the sunset, we. We said, okay, we're all done, and we turned around, and the moon was rising over the city. So so basically, we were able to shoot the city of Morro Bay with the moon rising over it, over the bay. It was just, you, you just don't know what you're going to find, and, you know, that's another great rule of landscape photography. Look look what's behind you. You always look behind you. Because you never know what it's going to be. I mean, that situation with the moon rising right after the sunset was, uh, I've never seen it like that. Yeah, I would say... It's a good thing Holly brought up. Uh, you know, with landscape photography, we're also focused on what's in front of us. Uh, look around, uh, turn around. No matter where you are, you're going to see something different. Especially if, if you're dealing with the atmospherics and you're at the golden moment. 
because some gold, you might have some gold in front of you, but you might have platinum over your shoulder that you're missing. And a key element, though, that this is probably bring this up right now, is when you lock onto an image and exposure or composition where you you constantly, you know, if you're sitting there, you're working it, you you got it all set up, and you take your shot. Don't be afraid to change your position after you've gotten the shot. Move around a little bit, change your position, because you can actually catch one, two, or three, or four different exposures in other areas just around you. Um, I think photographers tend to want to um, get really wrapped up in that one shot, but it's only there. You know, once you get the shot, fine, relax, move over a little bit, change to a vertical, you know, just mix it up a little bit, but, uh, and look behind you. <laughs> Good point, huh? Great advice. Yeah. Uh, more you know, beautiful sunset shot and... Yeah, this is a nice sunset shot, just, uh, this is at Ventura, California, near where we live. Um, just, just love the motion, just movement, you know, it's just, it's your basic beach shot. Um, it's... Okay, so the next kind of light we're going to talk about is direct light. So this is unfiltered light with strong shadows, but it does reveal intric intricate aspects of your subject and you'll see that we because of the such the light is so strong that most of these are black and white. Yeah, this uh, was shot around well we had it was it was raining pretty heavy the night before and another key element about the light don't be afraid to go out in a storm <laughs> or wait around, you know, in it a little bit and wait for something to happen. And uh, these shots were this series I shot in uh, White Sands uh, just after a horrendous uh, rainstorm the night before and um, freezing cold and we got out there and you started getting these great skies and with the sands there they're so white they just lead towards black and white and um, and just you know pushing the blacks and pushing all the uh, the contrast in the sands it's, uh, it was just a great great moment and we got covered a lot of ground really quick. We were just this this whole atmospheric was happening, and I think I think within a couple of hours, all those clouds were gone, and uh, the winds came in. And they were all dissipated. But take advantage of the moment, definitely. And you can see the strong shadows. So that was probably well, maybe it was about nine o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. but it was certainly dramatic. Mm -hmm. And these same shots in color are just, they just have less of impact to me. I, I'm just such a black and, I lean towards my, so much towards, towards the black and white. Um, and my commercial work, I do with some, a lot of sepia too. Um, but I really enjoy the black and white. And here's your iconic shot. And again, this was uh, pretty early morning. This is early morning. Um, yeah, of course, uh, the Tetons. And I had the advantage of getting up high. I had a, my rig is set up where I can get up pretty high. So I was shooting down on this one. The next type of, type of light we'll talk about is that morning and evening horizontal light. And um, we have some examples that I think are pretty dramatic. Um, so this was evening, right? Yes, it was evening. Yes, it was this evening. yes, this was evening, late, late afternoon. Um, and the sunlight was coming in from the left on this one. Um, this was kind of an interesting exposure, just to talk about a little bit. I mean, a lot of Mono Lake. This is Mono Lake, California. Um, it's ever changing out there, and we go out there quite a bit, at least two or three times a year. We're out there on a workshop, or we go out by ourselves and shoot. Um, it's always changing the level of the lake, so you get these, you know, these Tupa towers just uh, add a lot to it. And I was staring at this for quite a while before I photographed it. And I just got this envision, this dragon sleeping, you know, with its nose on the right side and dragging out to the left. And, and it's it's a little different from your standard tupa shot. And I just want I, we shoot it quite constantly, and everybody does. But just trying to draw a little uh, imagination and creativity into it. Um, and then of course the light of the sky was very dramatic. And in this type of sky, the tupas kind of reflect the sky in a sense because they're kind of almost a sense they're tupa in themselves. And these, these these Tupa Towers become like sort of like clouds on the water that reflect the sky, so you get like this sense of reflection of, of the sky to the water. But I'm getting too artistic on here. Sorry. <laughs> so here's an example of, you know, the sun was just about ready to set, 
um, that sweet golden light on this uh, image. And we have another shot right after this, and you'll see it's right after the sun is set. Yeah, and this uh, basically this is about changing your position. Uh, I was set up for this one because, and the sky was happening, so I was trying to get up underneath it. And when you see sky, always add it. You know, when you don't see sky, don't add it. You know, minimize your your your, your sky if you don't. If there's nothing happening in it, and concentrate on your foreground. Um, but like I was saying earlier. Changing position is so critical. So this is a an interesting shot. Really liked it, and I was happy with it. Then I said, "Okay, I got it." And then I switched positions to the far left of this. That and the the other thing that I wanted to mention about this shot is it was critical to get separation between all the elements, between all the trees. You see, the trees aren't overlapping in any way. So that was that was something that uh, Mark did intentionally. Mm -hmm. So this was so the next shot was probably taken what twenty minutes later. Twenty minutes later. Okay, so moved his position over, and this, this was after the sun had set. Yeah. So it's and then of course the, the story of the shot begins to create a little bit more interest. You're getting the the color, uh, and then you're getting the Sierra Crest in the far background. So, so again, more example of the light after the sun is set. Um, you get those nice pink skies, and you're lucky if you get a few alpine glow shots. Um, I, I got a really nice alpine glow in the eastern or in the Canadian Rockies a couple of years back, and when we saw this pink coming off, it was very exciting. Um, and then back to Big Sur for a morning shot, but this one was pretty special because here we are at Big Sur with snow in the mountains. Yeah, and it's a class, you know, it's your classic shot and you get the sun, the light coming up oh, as it's rising in, the, in it's rising in the east and it's kind of about coming in over the foothills and we're lucky to get a little bit of it on the snow there on the, on the Big Sur and then of course the clouds or the popcorn sky was always wonderful for landscapes and it's just a matter of I mean, this was a panic situation. I think this was one of those shots I had not intended um, to make, but I was actually doing something different. I was kind of leaning away from the uh, landscaping for a day, and I went for a bike ride, and I was heading down the coast, and I, I turned around, and I saw this, and I ran I, I, the heck with the bike ride, and I ran back to our little camper, and I, I woke Holly up, and we grabbed our gear, and we ran to this bluff, and I'm... In his bicycle clothes. My bicycle clothes. <laughs> And I instinctually just took, I, I just set up and I took the shot. And it was just, it was just fortuitous that it came out this way. Again, you got to be ready. You got to be ready for the moment, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to interview you now. Um, I know you use mirror lockup a lot when you're doing your landscapes. Do you okay. want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I would suggest using mirror lockup. And today with the cameras, the uh, live view is very, um, people love using the live view, and I use live view about half the time now. But in the sense of mirror lockup, you basically want to make sure that that uh, set your camera um, using a remote cable release, set it on mirror lockup, and this way you're going you're to get a nice sharper picture that way. Um, subsequently, can also subsequently can also do a live view with a timer set um, since you're using actually it's a, it's it's activating the sensor you're, you're viewing it live. You're going to get less of that vibration. So always use mirror lockup when you're doing these type of shots, or if you've mastered your live view and your camera does that, do that also. I've always been a big fan of the live view. Um, I, I tend to double check my focus points with my live view as well. Yeah, you'll zoom in closely on them and make sure you're, you're, you're in focus. Yeah. And this is another a shot. Uh, shot this in Yosemite Valley. I was using a 500 millimeter lens on their side of the valley. Um, I'm really a fan of this kind of light, uh, this late afternoon light in Yosemite that kind of bleeds over the valley. Um, and, you're, and, I, and I find it such an under-seen light in the valley. It's so, um, you know, we're, we're so drawn towards the iconic shots in Yosemite. And um, it's nice when you can get the light, the, the, the sunset gracing off the valley. And I had these beautiful spin drifts coming off uh, from a big storm that was actually Plummeting, plummeting Mammoth Lakes, which is on the other side of Yosemite. And this is Half Dome, of course, and I call this the, mo the monolith perch. It has a, there's a position there where, you, where uh, 
cancel took But he was not shot. standing on the, what no. do they call the diving board? No, I was standing at the diving board. <laughs> no, I was just shooting. Standing at, in the apple orchard yeah. in Curry Village. Right. But the color, uh, the light was really beautiful. It was kind of dancing off the edge of the, the snow. Uh, and these, these kind of like spiraling cones of, of snow with light. And then your classic Yosemite shot. So that was that same weekend we got the weather in Yosemite. Yeah. And you can see that it, this is a beautiful shot in both black and white in color. Mm -hmm. This is another one, another example in Yosemite. This is another edge. Uh, I call these the edge of the valley shots. Um, where, you know, you're. this is one of those situations where everybody's looking one way, and you turn around and you see something happening behind you. And so I just said, oh, my God, you know, the light was just clipping the top of the valley at sunset and uh, it just it just played with the whole composition. I was pretty excited about that. I always try to find something different, you know. We've been shooting for so many years that I'm I'm always seeking new positions and new locations for myself and others. Uh, but this one was really exciting when I got this shot. I really enjoyed this one quite a bit. So as far as this uh, low horizontal light, this next one is my favorite. I think it, it it shows that light to a T. So this is uh, this is in the Canadian Rockies. We were we set up a, we actually set out to get this shot at about four o'clock in the morning, and uh, we get to the top of this hill. And as the sun's rising, there's actually um, there's actually weather coming off the top of that Mount Assiniboine there. And uh, this just this low angle light as the sun is coming up is reflecting off of the of the peaks just perfectly. Yeah, and it's a key element. Like if you're doing any kind of um, workshop or you're contracting out with a guide, like I do how many times in places, locations I've been before, um, it always it's always good to have a really good consult with your guide and tell them exactly what you're looking for. Don't say don't assume that he knows what you want, you know, have specifics of what you want to see. And this particular guide, Derek uh, Holtfeld, he's in the Canadian Rocky Guide, and he, I told him, I want, what I wanted to do, I wanted to photograph sunrises on, in the back country of Alberta, and, um, and subsequently he said, yes, okay, and he set us up, and, and we, we basically, you know, clipped on our, clipped on our, clipped, clicked on our headlamps at, so I think it was like 3.30 in the morning, and hiked a few miles to these ridges, and just waited for it to happen, particularly after, and it was raining the night before, um, it was, there was a lot of turmoil in the atmosphere, and your landscape photography, you, you want to look for the bad weather, always look for the bad weather, you're going to get the best shots. Yeah, um, speaking of bad weather, there are a couple questions that maybe now is a good time to ask. Um, sure. Maureen Robertson wants to know, what do you use to protect your camera from the weather? Oh, good question, good question. Well, um, it's a couple of different ways. Like most of the cameras, uh, if you have a, even if you have a pro camera, they're, they're waterproof up to a point. Um, I suggest um, a, a shower cap if you're, if you're kind of uh, in a situation where you can't get some more advanced type of cover. But um, these little shower caps that they have in hotel rooms are great. If you're set up on a tripod and you're waiting for something to happen and the weather's a little inclement, Grab one of these elastic, high, elastic uh, plastic shower caps and just put it over your whole camera top. Or there's a couple of companies that have these. Uh, they're sort of like they look like big socks, and they're the shape of like kind of like a, a, a knee sock, and it, it's a little bigger than that. You can slip it over your lens. A plastic bag. It's knee like a plastic. Sock, yeah. It's a knee sock bag. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me when it's like a giant sock. But basically, it's got an area for your lens to stick out, and then also um, enough where you can get your hand in and operate it. Um, or an umbrella. A cheap umbrella is awesome. They cost five bucks. You can stick them in your backpack. They're lightweight, and um, we we exhaust them all season long. Sometimes you know they blow away or whatever, but we always they're cheap and they're easy to work. No problem. Um, cold weather situations. Uh, it depends how cold you're going to get. Uh, we've been in some sub sub freezing temperatures. Um, it's always good to acclimate your bag before you take it out when you bring it in. Um, like if you're going to be shooting in Yellowstone, you don't want to just take your bag, your camera into a warm room. You're going to get some condensation issues. Uh, just let it acclimate before you take it out of the bag. Um, but recommendation, an umbrella and a shower cap. <laughs> Simple stuff. Okay, good. And uh, we have a number, number of questions, but maybe do one more at this point. Um, okay. What are 
are your tools of choice when punching out the details on overcast days? That's from David D. Uh, well, I'll, well, I'll usually bring out um, well punching out the details. Well, if it's an overcast day, your details are given. You're going to get your foreground details. Um, um, and talking about post processing. Oh, post processing is that the question? How to? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh post processing. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll open it in Photoshop and I'll just do a raw. Um, graduation on it, you know, I'll, I'll bring it, there's, you can do a, uh, a neutral density uh, graduation uh, in Photoshop. It's, it's, one of, it's one in one of the uh, menus. Um, I kind of do a little bit of that, you know, to punch out the skies a little. Um, and it depends what kind of camera I'm using and how I'm going to, I mean, we can talk a lot about post-processing, but some, you know, a lot of cameras shoot differently. You know, Nikons shoot more green, Canon shoot more blue, and you just try to, you know, I think you just have to kind of balance. You know. So, any, uh, what do you think? What do you think, Holly? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we've had this discussion a lot yeah. about um, keeping when you when you're taking a shot that we we do it in we shoot in raw and then we bring it into Photoshop or into raw and do our post processing that way. Um, so we always have a like I say like a a, ver a raw file. Um, we can use you know graduated neutral density filters and that sort of thing but we prefer to to start with a raw file that we can we know that if there's um, if we have problems in post processing we can always go back to the original. Um, and there's a lot of there and also additionally there's a lot of ways you can you know there's a lot of dodging and burning you can do um, in color and in black and white. Um, selected masks. Selected um, masks. It's, it's, it's there's thousands of ways to get to the same point. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great and answers that. That, that kind of leads us to one other question here real quick, though. Uh, what type of filters are you using normally, and how often are you using your filters? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, a, photo a photographer, a friend of ours, uh, Lewis Kemper, um, we were up in, uh, we were shooting up in the uh, Alabama Hills uh, a, a few years ago, and he, he had just purchased a brand new um, L glass lens, and and we were having this conversation. He goes, "Well, I'm not going to put a filter on this two thousand dollar piece of glass. I think fifteen hundred dollars back then, whatever. Why would I put a hundred dollar filter on a two thousand dollar piece of glass or a lens? You know? And and he says, "I'm just not going to use filters anymore." Um, and that's I, when we started doing that. That's right? when we yeah. started. We stopped using filters. Really, uh, we were using grads back then. We kind of got away from it. We we're looking for we, you know, if anything, we don't use too many filters. You know, we just if you wait for the light to be right, you're going to be okay, and you get your exposures correct. And the dynamic range of these cameras are so good this day, you can actually, um, you know, bring up some of that easily. But don't use too much. I don't use a lot of filters on, on the lenses that much. And I think so many people are so awed by the filters and the post processing and the uh, the different effects that you can do. And and we're pretty much about getting the composition and getting the getting the photograph right. And then if you want to add something later, that's yeah. fine. But I you know, so many people are are adding the filters and the special effects before they even get the picture right. Well, yeah, and it's sort of like you know, if you get and the thing about it, even if you're shooting with an iPhone, if you can if you can if you can get your composition down, the the pic if the picture is compelling enough, it'll just sing on its own, and then you can take care of it. You can take care of adjustments later. Um, so much. I mean, it's such. I mean, I do. I use I use uh, a few uh, um, uh, Photoshop actions now and then. But I find we find ourselves using less and less, um, and just working on the composition. We're so sticklers on composition. Um, it's just yeah. So. Do you use like a polarizer? Um, um, and if I'm shooting, well, we were sh well. That's interesting. Uh, we were shooting uh, some dolphins off the coast here. We do a, a, a workshop on the Channel Islands, and if you're shooting, if you're shooting on the water and you're shooting uh, wildlife. Um, definitely a polarizer to cut down on that, but it's a different kind. It's not landscape so much. It's landscape and action on the water kind of deal. Um, I and I, even when I shoot water, I I sometimes don't really use them that much. I, you know, somewhat, but not that much because I'm just I don't know. It just depends. It just depends. But I, I seldom grab a polarizer and throw it on. Or I'm we're, I'm even finding that if you feel like you need a polarizer, take one shot with and one shot without. Yeah, that's true. 
because uh, when we were in Big Sur over the weekend, for example, the, the skies were kind of gray and the, the ocean was a little gray and you put a, a polarizer on it and it would change the gray to a darker gray, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I wasn't sure that that was what exactly the effect that we wanted. So we were instructing our students to, okay, shoot. Shoot with if you want to use your polarizer, shoot a shot without it and one with it. And then again, like I was saying before, then you have something to go back to. You have the raw, the the clear raw file to go back to if you find that the polarizer wasn't working in that situation. Yeah. So, any more questions? Yeah. No. Nope. Shall we move on? Five more minutes remaining, Holly. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll go through these pretty pretty quickly. Um, we talked about um, oh, oh, open shade, okay? So this is in a, a forested area where we shoot um, regularly in Big Sur. Um, this is, you know, really a fun fun thing to, to shoot in this open shade, and I'm going to kind of go through these pretty quickly. Um, again, beautiful redwood forest, open shade. Um, you will have some... Um, Problem. Sometimes you'll have a little problem with the sunlight coming through the trees, um, but you would just uh, actually expose for the highlights, and uh, you can bring up the low lights. Now, this particular, it was dark enough where I was able, we were able to shoot without um, a grad on this. So, yeah. so um, we seem to be running out of a little bit, running out of time, and we so we wanted to talk about some of. Uh, we, ha we do have an upcoming workshop coming up in the Eastern Sierras, and um, that one is July 18th to the 20th, and we wanted to offer any of the listeners on the Landscape Photography Show 10% off on our Eastern Sierra Discovery Photography Workshop, and there will be a link uh, in the show notes to that, or you can go to jansenphotoexpeditions.com and look at our Eastern Sierras, uh, the link for our Eastern Sierras Workshop. And we'd also like to offer you a free ebook. And the ebook just happens to be a landscape photography. It's all about the light. Um, and it, you sign up for our newsletter or blog. Again, there will be links on the show notes. Or you can go directly to our website, www.jansenphotoexpeditions.com, and sign up for our email, and we will send you a free copy of our, of our ebook. Um, so, just to make sure that we're had enough time, I wanted to be able to sh talk, talk to you about that. Do you want to go back to? Um, yeah, let's go back a little bit. Just a couple of so, the fire in the man-made light. Yeah, let's go to this one right here. This is a kind of interesting shot. This was that same shot earlier, that arch um, with the uh, starburst going through it, and the way this was composed, this was uh, almost pre-dawn. It was really dark when I took this shot, and I brought in some. Um, some lighting, some um, to do some light painting, but not to make it such an obvious light painting effect, just to bring out the foreground and the and of, of the shadows, just to get the exposure right, and uh, it just kind of made an interesting, kind of like nocturnal look <laughs> to this image. So you can see too, if you remember the other one with the starburst coming through it, the same location with two totally different. And it was an you know, aperture priority. I think it was like probably f18 on this. So, and here's one of our favorite man-made lights that we'd never expected. <laughs> this is a shot on the uh, Big Sur Highway. Um, I was lucky. This was a, a, about a 32-second exposure at f22, and I was lucky to get this because they were doing some construction on the Coast Highway here. So, <laughs> that was a fun one. That was fun. That's another man-made light situation. Um, not landscape photography, but it does show you what you can do with the uh, with with the light. And you handheld this one, right? Yes, handheld. I was shooting um, a large frame. I was shooting with my D3 on this one. So. The Hawaiian dancers. Yeah, it was. A, it was so. And we also do a, a hot air balloon workshop um, near us in Ventura in July, and uh, this is a fun one. It's actually it can be a challenging shoot because. You're shooting in the dark with the with the bright flames and the and the balloons are moving, so it can be a really fun and challenging. Yeah, and just uh, me and basically metering off the bright. When you're in these situations where it's dark like this, and you don't you're worried about the motion, just meter off the brightest object in the picture. And I think I shot this at, at I think 1600. 
no, not no, uh, ISO 1600. Um, yeah, and it's basically, if you meter off that light, you're going to get your exposure. And another example of the balloons. Yeah. So thank you. That, that wraps up our presentation. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about landscape photography yeah, and the light. Definitely. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Well, we'll, uh, like I said, we'll have their information in the show notes and uh, um, free ebook. That's nice of you. So we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we'll put that uh, information in the in the show notes as well. Uh, so just uh, check for those tomorrow. And we'll have that information up tomorrow. Um, we will go ahead and at this point go over to Jim. And uh, Jim is going to share his screen and walk us through our recommended photographers. Yep. And uh, but first, thanks very much, Mark and Holly. Beautiful yeah. image. You're welcome. We enjoyed it. We hope we were to help, help people out there. <gasps> So, okay, uh, recommended photographers. My choice tonight's Kyle Jones. He lives in Northern California. Um, he does beautiful photos from you know, the California coast, Yosemite, uh, the southwest U.S. This is uh, one from uh, Havasupai in uh, Arizona. And, um, and he's, he has a a number of other locations as well, but he has, I think, only around 500 followers. And if you visit his stream, I think you'll agree his work is just remarkable. So I hope you'll take a look and <coughs> like what you see. I love that shot. Yeah. Gorgeous. Okay. Let's see. Margaret, your choice. Um, this is a wonderful Swiss photographer, Dominique Dubide. Dubien. Dubien. Um, awesome uh, photographer. Uh, he does a lot of uh, American photography. Um, this is just gorgeous. I love the light that he's captured here and the wonderful colors. And I think you've got another one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is Valley of Fire, which is a place I've not been, but I just have to go there. Um, I just gorgeous capture. And he, he just does some wonderful work. And he's a frequent contributor to the landscape photography theme, so we're very pleased always to share his work. And uh, certainly this is uh, someone that uh, you will enjoy following, so I urge everyone to circle him up. Great choice, and I have to say I was privileged to meet up with him when he took his southwestern USA trip last uh, fall. Uh, cool. I didn't know that. Work. That's cool. Okay, Tom. Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Um, I picked a photographer who's based in Norway, um, Stian Klo, and um, he does some magnificent uh, shots of, of his, his area. Um, here's, here's one. I, I really love the, uh, the colors on the mountains, the contrast between the, the warm oranges and reds and, and the blue. Um, I really appreciate it. I you know, like the, uh, the still water and the reflection. And, and here's one of a, a frozen lake. And again, th this is re really, really a, a great landscape um, shot as well. So um, he's someone that I wasn't familiar with. So I think he's well worth following because he's got some wonderful um, landscape photos, um, many, many of them naturally from Norway. So, okay. so he's my pick. Gorgeous. OK. And let's see. Holly, I think this is your pick. Yeah. Um, this is a photographer, Greg Mitchell, and I believe he's, uh, he's in California. And uh, no wonder I'm drawn to his work. He has uh, some beautiful, beautiful shots. This looks like a mono, bay, uh, more, uh, mono lake shot. Mm -hmm. I love that color in the sky. Mono lake, so famous for its raspberry sky, as they call it. Nice. And next. Mm -hmm. And this I was just drawn to because of the color of the looks like maybe the color of the lupin and the colors of the sky is a beautiful shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And let's see, Mark. Yeah, yeah I like, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Derek Kine's work. I've been watching him a little bit. I'm, he's, uh, I guess, that, uh, such a patience in his work. Um, is it, let's see, is that shot up there? I can't see. This it. one right oh, here, that the, one ice, there. Okay. the Iceland. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Iceland's just amazing. 
amazing place, and and it's it's some of the some images are always you see a lot of the same images, but um, this particular take on this fall is a little different than I've seen the color banding, and it was really kind of unique, yes. and and of course uh, Multimo Falls, um, you know constantly you know very photographed quite extensively. But trying to get a little different feel to it, I, I get uh, this, is, this. This particular exposure has a really nice feel to to me. It just it kind of draws me in. It has such a moody, uh, emotional feel, and it make, it's really a really compelling shot for me. I like this one quite a bit, and we photographed that quite a bit ourselves over the years. And <laughs> this one, I I wish I would have gotten this shot. I really like it. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, thanks, uh, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, I'm not seeing it there. No. <clears throat> Might be on my end here. I'm seeing it. Okay, there. Something was wrong with mine, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, Mike Taylor, and Mike does tons of night photography and he's one of the best at it uh, this is just a wonderful shot um, you know he's really good at doing a lot of uh, work with it he's not scared to do some compositing and things to make uh, combine the Milky Way with some other things uh, go ahead and go to the next shot you know he, he combined this one is Milky Way with a, a, a star trail and then you know, one exposure for the foreground and just turns out to be an amazing shot. So uh, he's a wonderful photographer and you'll enjoy him. Yeah, that's magical. Cool. It nice. is beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. And that's it. Awesome. All right, great. Thanks, Jim. Well, we had a wonderful show. Uh, we appreciate the Jansons coming on. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, checking out their ebook and uh, all the information that's in there. And uh, with that, we'll have another show coming up in two weeks. Um, what is that date? July or July 1st? Yeah, July 1st. We will have another show, and we'll look forward to uh, to seeing you then. Um, we also have uh, in the landscape photography community a new contest going on right now. Uh, Margaret, why don't you tell us about that? Yes, we just started that one and uh, the Jansons were talking about the golden hour um, this <laughs> evening, that magical kind of 10 minutes of before and after sunrise and sunset. So that's our uh, theme this time is the golden hour. So uh, go get your very best golden hour photograph and share it to the landscape photography uh, community. That contest is going this week. And just a quick mention, uh, on July 15th, joining us will be Gary Crabb, who is uh, an outstanding uh, uh, photographer, another Californian. Uh, they just have beautiful uh, a thing to photograph out there, so maybe it draws these <laughs> wonderful landscape photographers. So we'll uh, look forward to having um, Gary visit us on July 15th. So wonderful, great. great. Well, we will uh, say good night to everyone and uh, hope to see you on the next show. Good night. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.